In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We begin this time of worship and Bible study on uh, the life of David. We begin with worship, and we do have an opening hymn that's in front of most of you, and uh, I will put it on the screen for everybody. It is uh, number 394, Psalms of Thankfulness and Praise. Those of you at home, as you sing, you may want to mute yourself. Songs of thankfulness and praise, Jesus Lord, to thee we raise, manifested by the star to the sages. about uh, one of those lines, uh, at thy great epiphany. Now, we know epiphany is a season of the church year, right? And it actually begins tomorrow. Tomorrow's the day where a lot, many churches, not many, some churches celebrate the coming of the Magi. That's the beginning of epiphany. And then uh, that season stretches out until Ash Wednesday. But what is the great epiphany? Christ's epiphany was when the Magi recognized him as a king. And then all of the other things that we'll study this Sunday will be, we'll focus on his baptism. There'll be a Sunday we talk about him turning water into wine. A lot of the things are in that verse. But what is the great epiphany? Christ coming. His second return. That's what that's talking about. That's when we will be like him. On the last day when he returns, you will see him as the king that he really is. True God and man manifest like never before. And 
we will see who we really are. Uh, our, our true nature and our uh, inheritance of eternal life is, is there, but it's hidden and it'll all be revealed on the last day. Uh, one just quick note, Jill knows this, but Tom and Sharon, you may want to mute yourself if you're going to participate in the worship. Not that I don't want to hear you, but you guys, because of the technology, you're a beat or two behind us. And so uh, it, is, it is kind of hard. So please read along with us as we do go through the worship and pray with us. Um, but it, it would, it'll help us all, <laughs> especially when we get to the, uh, if you ever notice when we're doing the Lord's Prayer, something, yeah, it, it's hard because just the way the technology works. So, all right, let's continue on. I just wanted to mention that it's not that I, I don't want to hear from you guys. No comment on your singing. <laughs> we can <laughs> you should actually mute me. Uh, we continue on with, with the introit. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the Holy Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and his song praise is fitting. Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. And those who move and steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father. Full of grace and truth. We pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and ask that you would manifest yourself to us through the power of words and wisdom and speaking of your Holy Spirit as he works through this word that we study today. Glean from, help us to glean from these things what we need for our lives. Give us things to meditate on and chew on. Grant us the epiphany of knowledge and wisdom and just a new way to look at these verses and a new way to see you, Lord Jesus Christ, and how you have worked through the lives of your servants, especially through David. We have these cares and concerns, Lord, that we would like to turn over to you to better focus our attention on our word, on your word today, knowing that you always act in grace and love for your children. So we lift up to you Pat Boland as she recovers from a heart procedure. Uh, please work for, uh, to complete that recovery and give her complete restoration of health and be with Wendy as she provides strength and support. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. Yeah. be with Grandma Jones as she heals from a broken foot. Uh, grant her uh, continued appetite. Uh, grant healing for her and grab, grant strength for Rita as she comes alongside her mother-in-law. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. be with our brother and sister, Steve and Vicki. Be with Steve as he goes through COVID and be with Vicki as she has the COVID symptoms. May they not turn bad, Lord. Keep them as healthy as possible. Bring them through this and grant them a full and quick recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with Tom and Sharon uh, as they were exposed to COVID and as they quarantine and, and exhibit mild symptoms. May those symptoms remain mild and may you grant them a quick and complete recovery. Uh, be with also their relatives uh, that were also exposed to COVID. Grant them complete and <coughs> quick recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with Charlene, uh, who's having a procedure on the brain to investigate an aneurysm. We ask that that would uh, be telling in a manner that would provide for her quick and complete healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with all children who, as they head back to school and back to college, Grant them safe travel. Grant them protection from disease, especially COVID. And from we ask, Lord, that you would quell and stop the violence and the warnings and all of that foolishness that's going on. Be with the school administrators and teachers. Uh, grant them wisdom, strength, and faith in you. Uh, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with Megan and Isaiah as they recover from COVID. May their symptoms be light and may they receive a complete and quick recovery. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with Pastor John, who is uh, still recovering from a uh, broken hip and now has uh, been diagnosed with congestive heart failure. 
May the medicine and doctors work in his life to bring complete and full restoration. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, a prayer of thanksgiving for Grandma Chrissy and for newborn grandbaby Colin Jane and for mom Renee. Thank you for watching over them and for uh, this uh, healthy birth and may they bring that baby under the waters of baptism. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with our brother Mikhail who has a, a spot on his lung and is awaiting the results of an MRI. We, we ask Lord and, and, and appeal to you that it not be cancer, that it not be anything bad uh, and that uh, the doctors would be able to grant wisdom to him and that you would provide all with grace. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We ask Lord that you would solve the streaming problems that we have had recently, that we might be able to uh, stream your worship service to people who can't be here and uh, your word would go out and your comfort and grace would be poured out with it. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, be with our sister Faith. Uh, just grant her safety and health. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Be with our sister Karen as she faces a mammogram and a shoulder exam. We ask that those might show good results and that she would have complete healing. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. All of these things we entrust over to you, trusting in your great love and care for each one of us. And all God's people respond. Amen. We now pray the collect of the day. Almighty God, you have poured into our hearts the true light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light may shine forth in our lives through the same Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Okay. You might hear a constant beeping. Do you hear that? We hadn't noticed it. Yeah. If, if you hear it, it just means that you have severe mental problems and you need to. <laughs> it's, it's the refrigerator in there and we're aware of it. We're working on it. It's nothing bad. It's not like the end of the world. This I don't think it is. We're hoping that. No. Is it Dari? No, it's it's just a it, the where, refriger cold still yeah. Yeah. <laughs> refrigerator is actually working. It's just telling us we need to clean the condenser. Uh, yeah. All right. With that out of the way, we are on Life Light Study Session 2. If you remember last week, we finished off with uh, 1 Samuel like 13 through 15, and we learned about Saul. Anybody remember what you learned about Saul? Saul was a nice guy, wasn't he? Yeah. He was an upstanding guy. Would Saul fit in as a uh, politician today? Yes. <laughs> Saul was anointed. Saul had the uh, spirit of the Lord fall upon him, and Saul misused it, and the spirit left him. He constantly, time and again, disobeyed the Lord. He selectively kept the commandments when they were good for him, but when they were anything negative, or if they meant he had to stand up to his people and tell them they can't have what they want, he folded and just let them do whatever. He's a brave guy, uh, but without the Lord, he's going to fail. So we're going to turn to uh, our session two, day one. I'm going to put that on the screen. And uh, a volunteer to read uh, 1 Samuel 1, 16, 1 to 13, if you would. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. I will, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul he'll, hears it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. 
and he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab. Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the, on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. The man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then the, Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Good. Just some thoughts as you were reading through, Norma. Um, why, why didn't they invite David originally? He's the youngest and least <laughs> important. <laughs> yeah, he was just a poor shepherd. Yeah, he they, he was he was obviously not of an age where he would be considered to be important to be at this feast. I was looking to see if if Samuel ever tipped his hand on why he was there that he was looking for a new king, and I don't see it here, but uh, especially if they knew Samuel was looking for a king, well, not, not young David. Look at my other sons, Jesse says, you know, my oldest, and then this guy, and then this guy. The one guy must have been real tall if they didn't look at his stature. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you think the brothers felt when Samuel was picked, or when uh, David was picked? They probably about ready to kill him. <laughs> There'd be a problem, wouldn't there? Kind of like the old Joseph story all over again. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. And, and we'll see that later on when we get to Goliath. We'll see how it's what his brothers think when David shows up to bring supplies and stuff. And yeah, there's some underlying animosity there. Uh, I kind of skipped over uh, question one, and it talks about uh, skimming first Samuel. We did that, and we talked about Saul, but I'm going to. Actually, I should have kept that up there. We're going to turn back and look at uh, we'll look at question 1A and especially look at uh, 1 Samuel 15, 20 to 23. And I'll read those and I'll put it on the screen for us. And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. So Saul's reporting to Samuel. God had commanded him to do some things. What is, what is Saul's report? Has he done them, according to Saul? According to him. Yeah. Samuel, I did it all. What the Lord said, it's all done. And here's what I did. Um, and then uh, verse 21. But the people took the spoil, the sheep and oxen, and the best of things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God and Gilgal. But there's this. We didn't destroy everything like he said. However, we're going to use them to sacrifice to you. Yeah, yeah, that's why we didn't destroy it, Samuel. We're going to give them to the Lord. So that's okay, right? And Samuel said, has the Lord, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. God need those animals sacrificed to him? Is he hungry? No. Is he in need of any of our offerings? Does he really need them? No. No. As been said, God could create money and, and bring money in from wherever. So why do we give an offering? Our gratitude for what he has given us. Gratitude and obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. It shows our obedience and it shows that God is more important than this money 
And we need that reminder because we like to gather under ourselves, don't we? Whatever the worldly wealth is, we want to gather under ourselves and every single one of us, including me, has a problem of letting it go. And, and Saul's no different. <laughs> and Faith, if you were here right now, I know what you would say. I know a pastor that got a big jet airplane so that he can serve the Lord better, and he has a big Rolls Royce because that way he can get to church in the way God would want him to get it. Right, Faith? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No. I think the verse would say there, that. There was a meme with, I hope you guys aren't Joel Steve fans, but there was a, <laughs> a meme I saw over Christmas had a picture of him, and it, how did it go? It says, when... Um, Sorry, but I mentioned it, so now I've got to find it. Give me just a moment. Oh, I shouldn't have mentioned anything. I may have to leave you hanging on this one. Ah, here it is. It has this picture, and it says, when God, God calls you to be a prophet, but you thought he said, make a prophet. <laughs> all right sorry joel can't hang with you buddy uh verse 23 for rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption as the iniqui as iniquity and idolatry so rebellion is the same as, as worshiping false idols as worshiping the devil and that makes sense right because when you rebel and say no i'm not going to obey you lord you don't have the lord as your god do you it's yourself or whatever else that you're doing. It's your money. Whatever is causing that rebellion, that's what you're worshiping is God. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. Now, there's some strong words from Samuel against Saul. Is Saul the kind of guy that would take that in a good light? Would he just say, oh, well, that's okay? No. no. As we're going to find out, Saul has a little bit of an anger problem, a big anger problem. Uh, so let's turn now to question 1A in our study guide. What attitudes in Saul's heart seem to have bothered Samuel and the Lord as much or more than his disobedience? It, it, it appears that Saul sometimes put himself first rather than God first. Yeah. And he seemed to be satisfied in what he did, even though he didn't complete what God said. He, uh, and this is why he would make a good politician today. He spins and lies, doesn't he? I say the manipulation of what he did. Yeah. He, he's going to forego what God said is correct, and he's going to reinvent his own idea. Well, this is what God really wants. If, if God was here, he would have said, yeah, you know, you're going to sacrifice the animals? Okay, then you can keep them. That's fine. I, I didn't think about that. <laughs> so it, it ties directly in with looking for a new king. And he's saying, I'm not looking at the outward appearance. We already have that with Saul. <laughs> That's the key to look at what's in his heart. Saul was the dude that the people, they, they were the one, they wanted him to be kicked because he was taller than anybody else. Ah, oh, there's our guy. There's our hero. Outward appearance. Knight in shining armor. And uh, we didn't study it in this, but back it was either uh, chapter 15 or 14 that talked about after a battle. Remember, Saul built a monument to himself. The Lord granted him victory, and Saul builds a monument to himself. Yeah. In uh, verse 15, Saul says, The Lord, your God, Samuel, not our God or my God, the Lord, your God. That tells you he's got a problem. And another place we, when we were studying uh, about Saul, it talked about he had actually built an altar and, and, and worshiped the Lord. It was the first one he ever built. So the dude is of age to be king. He's in his 20s or his 30s, and he's never came and worshiped the Lord before except for this one instance. That's a big, big problem, isn't it? All right. Question uh, 1B. Now study 16, 1 to 5. What do you learn from these verses about Samuel's relationship with the Lord and with Saul? We'll go back and take another look at those. First Samuel 16, 1 to 5. Well, 
The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? So all that's happened with Saul, how does Samuel react? Seems sad because he, his buddy didn't get picked. From what we studied about Saul in the past, how was Samuel, as Saul was messing up, what was Samuel's reaction? Was it always condemnation? Kind of like a father figure, wasn't it? He was like, hey, you can't do this. You need to straighten up and fly right kind of thing. Almost like a father disciplining his son, wanting him to change his heart and his mind. And Samuel had invested himself in Saul. And for whatever reason, maybe Samuel kind of looked at Saul and said, well, yeah, this guy does look like a king. We just need to shape him up. Uh, but the problem was the Lord, what, the, what was the Lord's uh, opinion of shaping up Saul? Out. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Yeah, it ain't going to happen. So Samuel, quit your whining and crying over Saul. Fill your horn and go. Go. We're, we're going we're gonna to pick somebody new. Um, Samuel said, how can I go if Saul hears he will kill me? So what's another problem? With Samuel regarding Saul. He's afraid of him. Yeah. He knows Saul has a temper. Wow. Yeah. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. And you shall anoint for me whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. So what can we garner from all that about Samuel's relationship with the Lord? He had a good one. Compare it to Saul. He was more obedient than what Saul was. Yeah. Saul, if, if ever there was a problem, either it was a, uh, a problem with his own heart. I want these animals or, or my men. They don't want me to kill these animals. They want them. And so Saul always put other things before the Lord. What's Samuel doing here in regards to his own safety and his worries? Doing what the Lord said. Even, even though it's dangerous to him, even though he's afraid something might happen, even though he really doesn't want to get rid of this guy as king, the Lord has said it, so he goes and he obeys, even when it's difficult, even when it's not what he wants to do. Is that some pretty strong obedience? Yeah. Yes. Does that speak into our lives sometimes? Yeah. 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 Comments or questions on that? Tom, just because you're at home doesn't mean you can't participate. <laughs> can you hear us, Tom? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I just wanted to know that you that you are invited into the conversation. Tom, I think you would say, one of the things you would have said would be, man, it's a tough job being a prophet. Samuel had a tough job to have to confront Saul. Uh, I think Nathan had to go up and tell David. Uh, it, it was a tough job. Could could end your life, I think. That's what I think Tom might have said. <laughs> that right, Tom. I, Al, I, are you picking on me? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm I'm missing you. I I think I think Tom would say, "Can we resurrect Saul and make him president?" <laughs> <laughs> that would probably be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I think we've already had some Sauls in the past. <laughs> I think that we have. More than uh, care. <laughs> All right, let's uh, go back to our study guide. <laughs> they don't see it. Question 2A. Samuel served as a prophet, God's spokesman of both law and gospel. Why might the leaders of Bethlehem have been trembling at Samuel's coming in verse 4? Thinking in regards to a, a, a law and gospel perspective. I thought they were going to kill him because he asked if they come, they asked him if he comes to peace. Who is Samuel? God's spokesman. He's God's word, right? He's, He's a prophet. He does speak the gospel. Um, 
you remember what did what did Samuel do when when Saul didn't kill King Agag? What did Samuel do? Kills him. <laughs> Beheaded him. So is Samuel some kind of a prophetic figure, and he's a pushover? No. No, he's in in in, in fulfilling what the Lord commands. He's a bit dangerous, isn't he? He carries the sword of the Lord. It was the Lord's will that this evil king who had done many, many evil things, that was judgment for him, and he'd be executed, and Samuel carried it out, and Saul would. So and here you've got this prophet showing up, kind of unannounced, and he comes to do two things. He brings the word of the Lord, which does have gospel, but what else? The word of the Lord has law, law yeah. and judgment. Why is Samuel here? Has somebody done something? Have we done something wrong? Are we going to see that sword? If they had any kind of an inkling, I mean, that uh, as we read at the end of chapter 15, if you remember, Samuel kind of splits with Saul. He's not going to see Saul again. And so if Bethlehem had had this inkling that there was a division or a rift between Samuel and Saul, Samuel shows up. Saul hears about it. Maybe the troops might come marching into Bethlehem after. Or if they don't know that there's something going on, they might think that Samuel and Saul are after something together. Yeah. Good. Anything else? We'll go on to question B, our challenge question. Sometimes Christian congregations today find themselves in conflict with their pastor. No. Ooh. <laughs> Compare 1 Peter 5, 1 to 9, and Hebrews 13, 17. Then describe the attitudes and relationships God wants his people and his pastors to have towards one another. So uh, let's take a look at 1 Peter 5, 1 to 9, first off. Somebody care to read First Peter 5, 1 to 9, either from your Bibles or what's on the I, street? Yeah. I will if you can hear me. We can hear you, brother. <clears throat> so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a, the words are, are covered over. Yeah, if you grab, is it, is it that box that has the pictures of all of us in it, Tom? Yeah. Grab that with your mouse and, and let, drag it down to the bottom of the screen. See what happens. Okay. I'm going to start over again. Yep. So I Please. exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not to be for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Close yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble so, yourselves, oh, therefore. That works there, brother. Just one to five for now. We'll actually come back to the rest of that in a bit. But, uh, okay. So the first uh, first four verses are aimed at pastor. Um, as a bonus question, does anybody know what the word pastor means? Shepherd. Shepherd. Yeah. yeah, shepherd. And so here Paul is uh, hitting on that, or Peter's hitting on that, right? Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Pastor, 
the flock of God. And so uh, a good job description for me is I act like a shepherd. Not as a king, not as somebody domineering, not telling you, you have to do this, or I'll kick you out of the church, or I'll condemn you to hell. That's not what it's about. Um, and who do, who do we call the great, the good shepherd, the great shepherd? God. Jesus. So take him as an example. How did he treat his people? He was a wonderful counselor, the mighty God. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, was patient, kind, loving, supportive, forgiving, caring. Slow to anger. Slow to anger. There's a uh, First Timothy as uh, the four, three has uh, he lists Paul lists the all the attributes that a pastor should have. I remember reading that you had to read that and discuss that before you went to seminary. That was part of my interview, and I was honest. I said I'm not these things, not all the time. And he said, "Good." Nobody is. <laughs> but with the Holy Spirit, you'll begin to be these things. That's your goal. And when you fall short, and if you fall short in front of your congregation, you ask their forgiveness. I think we love and respect that about you because you know that of yourself. You're one of us. Right. Yeah. Because I have seen pastors not acknowledge that, that we've had in our own churches. Yeah. That do have that authoritarian style and walks above us and not among us. Greater On the so pedestal, right? Greater yes. than, the, so greater I think than us. I love and appreciate you for that. And I think that's hard for the congregation then yeah. to go and talk with that minister because he thinks he's perfect. And, yeah. you know, when you have those problems that you need counseling. Mm -hmm. there, there are pastors that lose sight of that and they, they become very authoritarian and, uh, it's maybe harder in smaller churches because you sometimes don't have you don't have the people. Maybe you don't have enough people to have a church council. You don't have enough people to fill all the positions, so a pastor has to kind of fill in. And then everything revolves around him, and that becomes a danger. So he decides um, if, if anything changes as far as the administration of the church, the insurance, all that kind of stuff, all the decisions that Chrissy and Ron um, and Al, you know that the council makes, if there's nobody there, who's making them? Pastor. That's dangerous because that's just one man and he may not have the talent and the, the God-given ability to do that. And he possibly may do things just for his family. There's that, the more power thou gathers unto themselves, the greater that danger is. That's when you put on yet another hat of being the counselor yeah. and say, well, here's the pros and here's the cons. Now pray on it and make a decision. Yeah. And, and rather than, well, here's what we're going to do. And you do that. I, I firmly believe that you guys, God gives you insight. And you have skills and abilities that I don't have. And so I thank the Lord for you. Well, and in many small communities, years, especially years ago, the pastor was the most educated, the pastor and the doctor were the most educated people in the community. And actually, many congregations need the pastor spiritual and other counseling because they don't have that expertise yeah. that, that you had with your extra years of education. So that, that has kind of changed now because yeah. uh, as a society, more people have gone to college and uh, there, there is a lot of wisdom out there. Uh, but still, that's one of the reasons why they require our education is that you want to want to ha have some kind of idea of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think if you have a pastor that's understanding, the congregation is more willing to work with the pastor than the pastor is willing to work with the council. If you come from outside the church, especially in the business world, and you've been an administrator or something, you lead in a totally different way most of the time because I hold a paycheck over you. You don't do what I ask for. Well, how about if I don't pay you? How about if I don't give you a bonus? How about if I dock you? How about if I write you up? Can a pastor do that with anybody in the church? No. You're all volunteers. And uh, I lovingly want you to volunteer and help out. 
And, and if, if I take an authoritarian stance in any way, are you going to continue to volunteer? No problem. Let him do it. Why? Well, yeah. Why would you? And on the other hand, as, as human beings, we can all fall short of thanking people, right? I can realize that Doreen's a wonderful worker and look at all the, she came in here early and set everything up and put everything down and packs it away and organizes it. Well, that's Doreen, she's great. But do how often do I stay that to Doreen? Doreen, you're fantastic. You do. <laughs> but we, that's our human failing is sometimes we don't. How long would you continue to do this if I just totally ignored you? Oh, I'd probably continue. <laughs> If I came I in love and said, doing it. I don't do it for anybody, but yeah, God, it, I, I love doing it because it's for our church. That's the correct attitude. But if I was to come in and say, that's not right. Well, then. That, Look at that. The snow is not right. And that's that's my only reaction to it. I just now, think Chrissy did it. Uh, <laughs> now, then she would say, you do it yourself. Yeah. You, you, you want to lift people up. You do as much as possible. That's all part of leading by example, isn't it? If I'm doing that to Chrissy and to Doreen and to Ron, we're going to thank Ron this Sunday and, and uh, um, uh, Mikel. I don't know if he'll show up, but Faith, we're going to thank all of the former board members for serving. And that's part of leading by example. It's creating a culture of gratitude and thanksgiving. And if I'm not doing it, who's going to, who's going to do it? There might be a few champions. There's people that naturally kind of are, are do that, but if, if your pastor's doing it, it kind of encourages you to do it as well, doesn't it? And if somebody thanks you, are you more likely to notice and give thanks to somebody else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, and if, you basically are establishing a culture in our congregation yeah. by doing that, and, and if, then we, we tend to mirror what we see. And if you get thanks and you tell the other person, thank you, you feel more like, doing something in church. Exactly. The church. exactly. It's the same thing with asking forgiveness. The pastor, when he knows he's been wrong and he's done something wrong, he needs to confess and ask forgiveness because I, I still maintain that's one of the best gospel witnesses in this world because just look to our government, do people admit they're wrong? No. I didn't do anything wrong in January 6th. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong happened January 6th. Um, and if, if they do, it's always, I'm sorry. I made a bad decision rather. No one ever says I sinned, forgive me. You know, I, I made a bad decision. I made a bad choice. That kind of softens. Oh, yeah. I did wrong. Softens it for you. You're not taking full responsibility oh, for it. Are you? Yeah. Same thing with, I'm sorry. Uh, and this came from a, uh, uh, a children's, uh, a, uh, Growing Kids God's Way, which is, is a biblically based thing on helping parents, parent children, right? I'm sorry is insufficient. Your kids need to say more than I'm sorry because I'm sorry it's snowing out. I am. I'm sorry it's snowing out and you may have a tough drive home. Am I taking any responsibility for that? No, I'm not at all. But if I take the snow plow and snow and, and plow Norma's car in, Sorry, your car got plowed in, Norma. It sucks. Sorry. Please forgive me, Norma. Big difference, isn't it? Yes. When I have to say, please forgive me, now I'm taking responsibility for my part. Of it. And that's tough. What if Norma says, I'm going to forgive you? You idiot. <laughs> There's, when you say, I'm sorry, you ask for forgiveness, uh, please forgive me, you're putting yourself out there. And sometimes people aren't going to forgive you. And that's part of being a Christian in this world. You still say it. And then you know you did what was right, even though the other person doesn't forgive. But it still hurts. sucks. It's hard. It's, it does. It's tough. You commend them over into the Lord's hand. And love them every chance you get. Leading by example. And... Uh, as, as, you, as you guys said, and I admit, sometimes I don't lead well by example because I'm a sinner. But hopefully, I, in a good way, I uh, demonstrate love and forgiveness with you. But I think you'll find, even as the church council, sometimes they don't do the right thing. We're all humans. But we ask for forgiveness. Yes. We try to correct what we did wrong. 
and God is gracious. And sometimes he takes our bad decisions, even those that we didn't, we thought were right. We thought we were doing the right thing. And he, and he makes them good for our best. Glorifies them. You know. Good. And then uh, verse five now talks about laity, right? It says, you who are younger, but this kind of fits with everybody, um, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If, if I am being a humble servant with you, how should you react? Be humble back to you. Yeah. Is that often easy? No. No. Sometimes one of the hardest jobs a pastor has is to address sin in the congregation. I don't enjoy it, especially if I know it's going to hit home to people. It's hard. But if I don't do it, I'm not doing my job, my long gospel job. And then hopefully whatever sin I'm talking about with the congregation, I cover it over with the gospel. I impress to you, yeah, you're doing these things, but... Even more importantly, you're forgiven for them. That's the one. I like the way you say on Sunday when it, you always know, say this is a time where we normally pass a plate, but how you say it. Um, I don't know if we've ever had really that type before. You know, it was always like give, 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 give. And you're more or less saying, if you can, it's there. This is, you know, but, and then to say that about the people that are just there visiting. Yeah. That's not their responsibility. I don't think I've ever heard a minister say that before. It just makes it seem a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Think, the, I think the visitors are more comfortable. Yeah. Now. You don't pay to come in the sanctuary, ever. <laughs> it's not about money. Because once again, does, does Jesus need my money? No. No. You need to obey him. You need to show obedience and love to him by giving an offering. And then once again, how much you give, Doreen, is between you and him. I, the only thing I would do is I, I would seriously, and as each year goes by, encourage us to prayerfully look at where we're at, what's changed, and for some people, maybe they're making less. So maybe their offering might actually be less. But maybe for some, it might mean they give more. It might mean that their money they're getting is the same, but they desire to give more out of love for God because it all belongs to him. And it's a process of letting it go. We don't let it go easy, do we? The process, but the but the more that you let go, the easier it generally gets. And that's not just to the Lamb of God, but some of the special offerings, the one for the tornado, and uh, the Lenten offerings, and the baby bottles, and the Heartbeat Crib, and Mercy House, and Franklin Avenue Mission. All of those things are ways, and not just about money, but time and talents as well. The more you do that, what I notice in people is the more they continue to do. It's kind of like a floodgate, you know? You open up a little hole and all of a sudden it gets bigger and bigger and it flows out more and more. That's where I think our congregation is more giving than most congregations. Especially monetarily, what I see going on in the circuits, yeah. Um, but where we all need help is it's the same people are always here to show up and help with things. And so uh, that's the main reason we're going to have the stewardship emphasis going on. It's mainly for time and talents. And I want to keep it that way. I don't want it to be, I don't want you to hear stewardship and think, oh, crap, pastor's going to talk about money. Talk about money because no. Uh -uh. But in the past, that's all they seem to talk about. And kind of I don't know how the other people felt, but it kind of turned you off. Yeah. And, oh, it's going to talk about money again. Yep. I know stewardship Sundays next Sunday. I'm not going. <laughs> and, and thank God we have people working in the Michigan district like uh, um, Rick Wolfram, who came. You notice money was the last thing he talked about. The other stuff. Because that's really more important. God doesn't need our money. He wants your love and obedience, and that's what he focused on. God's given you everything, and you're a manager. It still all belongs to him. 
knowing that and knowing that God gave his most important thing, which is his son to die on the cross and rise again to save you, knowing all that, now you react appropriately. <laughs> all good stuff. I don't want to turn this into a, a stewardship study, but uh, it's, a good, it's a good thought for us. Yeah. You know, uh, most of us were taught stewardship was just funny. And I think now that we're finding out different things about stewardship, it's important. Let's take a look at the other verse uh, we we're supposed to look at. That's Hebrews. Hebrews 13, 7. Somebody want to read that for me? 17. Uh, 13, verse 7. Oh, 17. You're right. I'm sorry. Yep. Obey your, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keep, keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account, let them do it this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So your leaders and your pastors, submit to them, because what are they doing for you? Keeping watch over your souls. Why is, it, why is it important that they watch over your souls? What could happen? You could fall away and go to the devil. Yeah. And what leads us down the path to falling away? I don't think I'll go to church Sunday. Then Part that, of it. That Sunday got easier than the next Sunday. But there's there's something else that's happening. Because you don't go to church, there's something else that happens. And it's and re, it, think especially about sin in your life. You're not asking for forgiveness. Which means, what about your sins? Are they not forgiven anymore? But your your heart, what is your heart condition? Sometimes it's hardened. Yeah, and that happens when sin doesn't really matter, right? Right. Do you anybody enjoy confessing sin, either personally, privately, or publicly? It's shameful. Yeah, you don't want to do it, do you? Nobody wants to admit they're wrong. Because a part of us, part of me dies when I confess my sin. Excellent. And it's that sinful nature that dies. And that's, doesn't don't like that. Doesn't want to die, does it? Painful. Not at all. And, and so what happens when you separate yourself from the word? Yes, when you separate yourself from going to church, but not just that. When you separate yourself from doing what you're doing here, studying the word, examining your heart in light of the gospel, all of those things, then all of a sudden we start to, like Saul, spin. Well, that wasn't really wrong. God told me to sacrifice or, or kill all these animals, but it's okay because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice them. I know that's okay with the Lord. It's not really a sin. It's not really disobedience. And that builds one upon the other until the point when sin's no longer a problem. And we kind of worship ourselves. We worship ourselves. And then why do you need a Savior if you're not really a sinner? Do you need a Savior? You want somebody that will come and touch you with his magic hand when you're sick. You want somebody that will bring somebody to pull you out of the ditch if you're in trouble. But as far as every day, total reliance on the Lord. No, I'm an American. I can, I can buy what I need. I can make what I need. I only need the God, the, the break glass in case of trouble, God. And that's not what the Lord came to be. So as a pastor, that's one of the reasons why we're supposed to preach the law is to shake you up and have you recognize the sin that's in your life but that that preaching of the law and the sin you know where it starts with me when i read a passage and it's law the first question i need to ask is how does that affect me where does that law hitting me in my heart where does it hurt and then jesus and i talk about that and then i ask him how does that affect my congregation and how can I present that before them, not just to crush them, but so that the gospel can come in and heal them and draw them closer to Jesus because of it. A pastor's job as a shepherd is so challenging. Put on your parent hat. You worry about your kids and your grandkids every day. Every day you pray, God, take care of them. And under the fourth commandment, they should honor their mothers and fathers. From what I read this to say, you're our shepherd, and you 
worry about all of us every day and say, oh my gosh, I haven't seen Alan Church for a couple of days. I've got to talk to him. And Hebrews is telling me that if pastor talks to me, listen to him because he's got to be accountable just like my dad had to be accountable for me. And you're not talking to us shamefully, you're talking to us lovingly. Exactly. The words, the words that I'm proclaiming to you, if I'm doing my job at the moment, are not mine. They're from God. They're from God. And sometimes they're words that, if it was up to me, I'd rather not say. Those times when I have to preach about current events like homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, and all, I'd rather, I'd, I'd like to not preach about those at all. Because that opens the door for people to uh, claim that I'm a homophobe and I'm uncaring and, and, and add on everything else. I'd rather just shut up about those. But to be obedient, you have to talk to them. Yeah, because if they're a problem in somebody's life and I don't address it, I'm going to be accountable to the Lord. How come you didn't? How come as my servant, you didn't tell somebody? It's an old example, but it's like I see Ron standing out in the middle of the road and the bus is coming. Well, Ron's really comfortable out there. He's sitting in his chair. I don't want to go bug him. Maybe the bus will stop on its own. Maybe he'll see it. No, I got to run out there and grab him. I got to grab him by the short hair and drag him out of the road so he doesn't die, even if he doesn't want to go. And that's kind of the preaching of the law. I know people don't want to hear it sometimes. I'd really rather not say it, but sometimes you have to. But One I, time I noticed that that was really prevalent was when we're Democrats, Democrats and Republicans was close to uh, voting time. And man, some people, yeah. it's like, man, yeah. he was just, you know, I don't know. I don't take it that seriously, but hey, you know, we didn't come to church because he talked about this. Republicans right. are doing. I'm thinking myself, it's, you know, you are what you are, and that's your own personal. But yeah, we have to talk about those things, or it's just like listening to the news. <laughs> we listen to it, but you can you can weed through it, you know. Don't take it as the law. Jesus is not a Republican and Jesus is not a Democrat. Yeah. The Republican Party is not the party of the church, and neither is the Democrats. It's not. And anytime you solely line up yourself with one party or another, um, you're kind of making them your God. You are. You want to you want to examine what each party stands for and votes for in light of God's word, realizing that neither one of them are obedient to the gospel. Neither one of them are. Okay. The Republican Party tends to not care for the poor. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that there should be restrictions on those people that are coming in from other countries. I need to, there does need to be some kind of vetted, but there are people that don't want them here at all. And uh, that's not biblical, is it? We're supposed to love others, care for others. And on the other hand, uh, God's pretty clear about what he believes about uh, abortion, transgenderism, and homosexuality. All they got to do is read the book. So neither party, uh, in my opinion, is obedient to God's word. So you do need to pick and choose. You do. Prayerfully consider when you go to the polls. As, as a pastor, I cannot uh, endorse any particular person. And I won't. I can talk about issues. Oh, well, yeah, the separation of church and state yeah. rings loud and clear. And I see that a lot in the Lutheran church where we really made Lutheran churches. Yeah. But that Bible study we had about the separation of church and state was really helpful. State cannot speak to our beliefs. Exactly. But the state needs us in, as a moral compass. It needs us to speak morally into the laws. That's the way it was designed. I think it was Jefferson. He even said, if we're going to let people make laws, the people, they need to be moral. Otherwise, this country's lost. And hey, guess what, guys? We're lost. <laughs> the moral laws no longer mean anything. There's no moral absolutes. Anyhow, that's a Bible study for another. I, I just, I like to say that, though. But you're right, Doreen. It's a hard time. And things need to be said. And uh, I, 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 of course, have my own political leanings. I do. I'm a human. But I can't, I don't want to pass those along to you. I want you to be an informed Christian voter and prayerfully decide, because I may not have it right. I've studied a lot about theology, but I'm no politician. I don't, political science is not my, not my forte. I can speak into it theologically to some extent, but anyway. Any other comments on that?
back to our study guide. And by the way, if you see me erring on one side or another, if you think that I am speaking out of turn or leaning in one direction or another, you can come talk to me and I would be glad to hear that because there's a guard I have to put up. And I, I sometimes wonder how, <laughs> how well I guard that. All right, question three. First Samuel 16, 13 says, and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. When the spirit of the Lord came upon someone in the Old Testament, usually a prophet, priest, or king, that person received extraordinary enthusiasm, vigor, and strength to carry out God's purposes. How might others have seen the spirit at work in David? And we are asked to jump ahead and look at verse 18. But before we do that, just from what you've seen of him before, or what you already kind of know of him, how might you, uh, how might David have shown that? Think about what we know about him as a, as a, uh, uh, as a shepherd. He took good care of his flock. He was, uh, he was, he was brave, wasn't he? Yes. He was strong. And he, and he cared for them. He, he took responsibility for them. <laughs> now jump ahead. Somebody read uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 18. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse, a best man, who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man. And the Lord is with him. In that verse, how can you tell that the Spirit of the Lord is with him? Well, it tells us, doesn't it? Yes. Well, how, how, do, how, does this, how does his behavior and his attitudes and what people see in him, how does that reflect the presence of the Lord? He treats people well. He plays the heart. That's a God given talent, isn't it? Not necessarily a spiritual gift, but it's all talents come from the Lord. Norma plays the organ because the Lord gave her that talent. He's not even a warrior. Prudent in speech, a man of good presence. Mm -hmm. I mean, his actions show it. Yeah. Compared to Saul, or is Saul any of those things? No. No. Those are all examples that the Holy Spirit is with him. Question B, in whom do you see God's spirit at work today? In what specific ways could you encourage this person? I'm going to say that we can see God's spirit at work today and the people that are around us this morning because they're there they're listening and they're learning and they're searching and they're they're attempting to be open all of you here because all of you are people that are involved in some kind of ministry or thing in worship and Irv who's up in the rafters working I see the spirit of God at work in all of you there's other places you could be, isn't there? There's other things you could be that, are, that maybe are more enjoyable. I mean, but you, Dorian, you have a spiritual gift and, and, and all of the things you do around here, helping and decorating and stuff, that part of that's a spiritual gift. And I, I know you enjoy doing it, don't you? But you could do that at home. The more you do it, the more you're here, <laughs> yeah. the more you want to be. But you, you miss a couple Sundays and it comes easier and easier. Yeah, it yeah, does. Yeah. But, but. Be, because you're willing, and, and this is a sacrifice of your time, because you could be doing other things and possibly doing it for monetary gain, but you choose to be here, and that's a sign of the Spirit working in you. It is. I, some of the people I put down, and you can think about it. I mean, I know I'm asking you off the cuff, but uh, our district president, David Meyer, if you ever listen to him preach, or you're around him and talk to him or see him make a presentation, the Spirit's active in him. He's an amazing man. He's the kind of guy you just want to listen to. And uh, unlike me, and unlike what they tell most of us pastors, uh, his sermons last uh, like 30 minutes, maybe a little more, but you want to listen to him. He's dynamic. 
And I think what he's done for the Michigan district and where the Michigan district has been under his leadership is amazing. I talked to my, uh, for my friend who's a pastor in Minnesota, and he's envious of the Michigan district, some of the things that resources and things we have available here. Um, if you watched last Sunday, uh, the uh, O Come All Ye Faithful, that was the opening and closing hymn. That whole presentation is made free by the Michigan district. They had people come in and arrange and record those hymns. Uh, they're all public domain hymns, so you don't have to worry about copyright. And they're available on a website that pastors can pull down and use in worship. That's a wonderful thing. I was listening from home and I thought, man, we have never sounded so good before. Because yeah. I couldn't see the congregation. Yeah. And I'm thinking, wow, who is in that church today? Norma just learned how to play guitar. Yeah. So she did a great job, <laughs> didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> um, our circuit visitor, uh, uh, Pastor Behrman from Faith Grand Blanc, wonderful man. Very supportive of me. We had a pastor's Bible study uh, yesterday morning, and he hosted it. He preached excellent sermon, very uplifting, very encouraging for us in these hard times to not neglect to, in ways we can, carry the gospel outside the church, make alliances and connections with people in the community and do things like that. And just talking to him, he's uh, very down to earth. Not judgmental at all, but he really cares about, you know, each one of us in the circuit, how we're doing and what our needs are. So he just emulates a caring, loving attitude. Pastor Hensler, I love that man. And I see the spirit working in him. And there's a wisdom in there uh, that I'm so happy that he's here. And I see your reaction, what he preaches. Uh, you can tell the spirit's working in him. And he really generally, he really cares. He's a very humble man, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Very humble man. And perhaps if you look around, you can see the spirit at work in other people. And the thing is, we don't manifest these spiritual gifts and things perfectly. We falteringly, don't we? Mm -hmm. That includes me too. And that's just our condition. It's the Holy Spirit is working in us through the means of grace. And we're growing day by day by day. But we're never, ever going to be perfect. That day will come at that great epiphany on the last day. Then you'll be made perfect. But until then, it's always a process. And uh, sometimes instead of taking a step forward, it seems we take step a step back. But the Lord doesn't let you go. He'll encourage you to come back, keep moving forward. I have one. I do too. It's Jill. I can tell Jill has the Holy Spirit because she's blue. That blue or no. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jill. It's you. You have made a tremendous difference in our congregation. Thank you. It's That's the Holy Spirit too because this is where he planned for me to be. He talked about predestination. I mean, he knew I was going to come here back before I even became a pastor. And uh there's a question here, and maybe we'll address that. But the road, you look back at the road, and he was guiding it the whole way. And so if, if it works, it's because it's his hand, and this is where he wanted me to be. Now, uh, that being said, back when you guys were joining and building, coming together as a congregation, there's gifts that are needed there that I don't have. So why wasn't I here back then? When my time. He could have empowered me for that. But as I look at what was needed, that's not my forte. So I was blessed with somebody else's work. And it wasn't just Pastor Berger, but it's yours. All the people that were involved in bringing these two, Peace and uh, Redeemer together and building the building. He empowered you to do that. And I feel very grateful because I'm walking in and now it's all done. And uh, my prayer is, Lord, just help me to move it forward and, and don't let me mess it up. You guys are you guys are known, and I was told by President Meyer when he uh, came to me after I received the call. He said that congregation is known throughout the Michigan district, and you're receiving a big uh, blessing. To us, it was to be a redeemer person. It was just coming home when we came here, and there was Ron and Karen, and <laughs> you know all the ones that we loved from years ago. And it was just like coming home. But I didn't realize until you talked to people outside the church how special that was. Yeah. I mean, it was special, but how unusual that was. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is a very special thing. It is. Yeah. 
And just so you know, I, I you know I don't mean to bolster your ego too far, but you're you're known. You're known in the Michigan District offices as a success story. And 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 most of the times, what happens when two churches come together is they keep one entity, and people leave, and it doesn't work because it's all about well, that's not the way we did it here. That's not the way we did it before. We you know you can learn from what happened at Redeemer and Peace, but that doesn't mean that Lamb of God has to follow either one of those things. I think when we were coming together, we learned that if you try this thing and it doesn't work, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, you fail. You try it, you go around and try something different. Right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anyone else? Anything else you want to comment on that question? How about how about ways? How can we encourage each other? When you see somebody that's operating with, with spiritual gifts and and giving of themselves, what's a good way to encourage? Do you first of all do you need to encourage them, and how? One thing is acknowledging. Yeah. Them. And that's part of thanking people, isn't it? Maybe helping them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanking them and recognizing, you know, this this is good. And, and Doreen, I can honestly say. The decorations you put up here, I love them. They're good. I wish you'd include Chrissy because she's been here just as much as Chrissy I have. Chrissy is you as well. And and thank you, Doreen. That's what you're doing she's as part of it. She's been here just as much, yeah. Bring, bring yeah. to light, yeah, bringing yeah. to light somebody that needs to also be recognized. That's a wonderful thing. I won't see her tomorrow if we don't, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I especially like that Norma, you said that, right? You helped them, right? Did you say that or was that you, Joe? Who said help? That's very important too. I, that doesn't that mean a lot when you're working on something and somebody wants to come along and not take over, but just Doreen, how can I help you? What? How do you think this looks? And to see Jill on Sundays, I mean, what she does, I wouldn't even attempt. And then after we're all gone from here and you're leaving and you've been here for half an hour, forty-five minutes, of coffee. Jill is still sitting over there finishing things and it, it just it's mind-boggling that we have so many different people that can handle all that stuff and it's all free will mm -hmm. yeah well, actually money. after all you leave what i've noticed is jill's all of a sudden doing online gambling that's what she does exactly. <laughs> absolutely not no 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 let's not do that uh, and Tom, who's been silent here, uh, I really appreciate Tom because of his presence in Bible studies. Yes. And uh, he always has something well thought of and important to say and, and uh, spirit-led knowledge and wisdom. And I appreciate that in you, Tom. Well, thank you very much. One of the comments that I'm going to make is, is to you, but to the people of the congregation. Never should we ever put you on a pedestal so high that if you fall, okay, <laughs> that you break. Yeah. And if you do fall, at least we should help pick you up mm -hmm. and let you know that you're forgiven and that you continue to lead us. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate that because this coming Sunday, I'm going to let loose a Baptist tirade on all of y'all. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> oh, no, no. By the way, I also appreciated the fact that Doreen's dog agreed with everything she was saying. <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. Doreen's dog, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when I talk, she listens. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move along here, see if we can't finish this uh, day off before uh, time runs out. Question four, David, in contrast to Saul, was teachable. See verses one to 13, especially verse seven. Why is this quality indispensable in those that would serve God? So 16, verse seven. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or his height or his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees, man looks at our appearances, but the Lord looks on the heart. What does what was in David's heart have to do with him being 
teachable. It's love for God. Yeah. It's not about ourselves. Yeah. So we would say he had humility, right? And he had compassion too. For me. Compassion. How do we learn? Do I learn anything if I always do everything right, don't do anything wrong? No. And I know everything already. We learn from our mistakes. Don't tell me, I know. I know everything already. Yep. So when you're never wrong and you don't realize you make a mistake. And and that's generally is how we learn, don't we? Ron, you brought it up with the church. We don't we don't condemn ourselves when something doesn't go right. We learn from it. Let's not do that again knowing that the Lord forgives all our mistakes, right? If you don't have a Lord that forgives, then do you really want to focus on your mistakes? No. no. And that's why the gospel is what really changes us. Otherwise, the law is great. The law shows you you did it wrong, but if there's no incentive there to try again, is there? There's just condemnation. Because then you say, well, what if I do it wrong again? What if that's wrong? What if it only makes things worse? But if there's a God who loves and forgives, we don't need to worry about that, do we? We do use wisdom and prayerfully consider what to do. But in a heart that's humble, and, and as Ron, as you said, that is in love with God and that is looking to God and looking to godly people around us too, right? God puts us with each other. This kind of goes back to me talking about having a good church council. They're there for me to listen to and learn from. And to take advice from because I don't have all the answers. Chrissy, in what you've brought to the education is just fantabulous. I could not do that without you. We would not have what we have. We would not have the uh, the the summer uh, vacation, uh, Bible, vacation school. Bible school. I couldn't do that. I can't. Like I've always said, nobody does anything alone. No. We got Chrissy. We just need kids. But but you <laughs> but you. In our church, it's very supportive. You get it started, and we fall in behind you, don't we? Yes. Yeah. But you're right, and that that's part of your humbleness too, is you don't claim it all. No, but it but it is, is a wonderful thing, and I I I, I think you know, uh, Mondays are my day to pray for the church council and for the elders, and I thank the Lord for you and the other council members every single Monday. Yep, you need you need humility. You need to be able to confess and look and see where you're wrong. So we got one more here uh, for personal reflection, sharing optional. Meditate on 1 Peter 5, 5 to 7. Humility and a teachable spirit are closely linked. What would you like to say to your Lord about your own struggles with teachableness and humility? What might you want others in your small group to ask God for you into this regard? So I'm going to read this, and this will be something you can kind of chew over and meditate afterwards, okay? Let's turn to uh, 1 Peter 5 again and read verses 5 to 7. First Peter 5. We left off on... Uh, Verse five. So pick it up again. We'll do five to seven. If somebody wants to read that on the screen or in their own Bibles. I will. Okay. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Humble yourselves. And this is important. You know, as you humble yourself, sometimes you can start to feel pretty low. That's a result of taking an honest look at yourself. But God in his gospel and in the absolution lifts you back up. 
because yes, you're not perfect, but you know what you, each one of you are? You're his precious child. He thinks the world of you. He thought so much of you that he came down and climbed on the cross. Yeah, it was for everybody, but you know what, Chrissy? It was for you, for you, Norma, for you, Dallas, for you, Al, for you, Ron, and for you, Doreen, and for me. Meditate on that sometime. He came for you. One of the changes the Lord did in me when he called me back is I believed in the corporate kind of thing. Well, he came for everybody. Like Norma, a little bit better than me, but he came, you know, still, I was included. No, he came for you, Pastor Mark. You who were, really were a poor, miserable sinner. You guys didn't want to know me when I was out in the world. I was a pretty, I was an idiot. But he came for me, and he loved me, and he changed me. And he did that for each one of you, too. He lifts us up. Be sober-minded. That doesn't just include drinking. That means to have your focus on Christ and the gospel and his word as much as possible. And, and don't let the ideas and thoughts and temptations of the world cloud your judgment. Don't buy into the party line and we just need to elect the right president or have the right governor if they're the right party. Every No! Trust in the Lord first, and whoever is in power, pray for them, that they be God's humble servant. Because if he can work through a poor, miserable sinner like me, I don't care what party they're in, he can work through them too. And the devil, he's prowling around, and, and as you uh, mess up, be, he'll be sure, he'll be there to tell you, Ron, that was a big, you really messed up big time. Do you think Jesus can forgive you? Do you think your family can forgive you? Do you think the people at church can forgive you? Those are all, I've heard those words. And, and the answer to all those is, yes. go back to hell where you belong. I have a savior on the cross who makes my life right with God. And through that, because I'm right with God, I am now going to be right with others. Okay, any other final comments on that? It makes us humble, but also there's a joy in that humility, isn't there? To know just where we stand with the Lord. That he doesn't hold your past sins over you. He doesn't wake up in the morning and say, well, Pastor Mark, yep, I'll forgive you today, but you remember what you did yesterday? Remember what you said last night? <laughs> he doesn't do that. So it's been a good study for you? Yes. I'm sorry, and I'm glad, Chris, I'm glad you were able to join us anytime. Anytime you want to join us, it's a wonderful thing. Did each one of you get, did I have study guides for everybody, or Doreen, did you get one? Yeah, we, we picked one up. And Al, you got one? Okay, good. Because uh, I can order more if I need to. So if you can't make it every week, I understand. Zoom in if you can, but you're more than welcome. Wednesday mornings is what we do. Tom, glad you and Sharon could uh, zoom in with us from home. Thank you. You only see my face, but Sharon is listening, but out of the frame. And when, go on ahead. It's all about you, right? No. <laughs> just, just no, it, it, it isn't all about me, I assure you. Sharon, we, we, we uh, continue to pray for you. I hope you feel better. She acknowledged that with a big thank you. And Hello. we do send our love to everyone. Joe, good to see you, even though you're blue. <laughs> Thanks. It's my favorite color, too. <laughs> I like you, blue. I do. Let's close with prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gift of grace and that promise that uh, we are still your precious children every single day. Even when we confess our sins to you, you don't hold them against us. You remind us of the truth that it Christ has already done for us, that they are washed away and forgiven and don't cling to us anymore. Help us to leave here with that affirmation in our hearts. Uh, keep us humble, keep us teachable, and bring us back together again tonight and this Sunday so we can continue to study your word and receive the wonderful gifts of your sacrament. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 Tom, hope you can make it with us tonight. Jill, yep. hope you can join us tonight. and Maybe we'll see you here at church a little bit later on. You're going to come yep. and bug her? Well, at least try to Zoom. Very good. Okay. Thanks. God bless your day. Bye.